Okay, so we continue studying the double fianchetto and now we'll see another game from Grandmaster, French Grandmaster Fresinet and this double fianchetto line we can find this on uh, rapid games but I also found a lot of uh, slow games played by strong players with this line because as uh, we always tell this line is uh, quite flexible for white so we play the usual moves here we play b3 we we point out that playing b3 first is key because then we play bishop b2 just in case we want to avoid any trick on this uh, diagonal and then we play bishop there so what we are going to study in this game is what happens when black plays a pure king's indian setup when he plays c6 knight d7 and then e5 that would be what a king's indian player plays so when he plays d6 and i think uh, we saw this line in the introduction video too we can play d4 because if he plays e5 now i don't mind taking and okay here this runs into queen takes and here whoops yeah knight takes and then knight d3 or knight c4 we are just in time protecting our bishop we keep an extra pawn so in the long run we are just winning when we play that so when he takes on e5, I mean, when we take on e5, he can probably try knight d7 or knight, uh, knight g4. And, well, we probably have a lot of lines here. I like playing something like this or knight d2 as well. And,. We can find this um, in the introduction. In this game, uh, Black plays as a king's Indian. He'll try playing e5, but he'll prepare it with uh, the standard moves. And I like knight vd2 first. There's no real difference. I mean, we can just castle and then we go for knight d2 since uh, the double fianchetto is too flexible I don't mind playing c4 plus knight c3 because we already know his pawns are on c6 and d6 I mean we know it's a king's Indian already so I would place the knight on a powerful square like c3 what uh, white is trying to do here is play e4 and we can also transpose to a pyrrhic defense so yeah this makes a lot of sense too we can choose a lot of setups for white perhaps since i'm a d4 player I would play c4, knight c3, but uh, Fresinet, he probably plays both d4 and e4, and he feels comfortable playing an open position, so I mean, this is very good as well. Black plays uh, queen c7. Another thing I, w I would like to say about this uh, specific position is we know when we play the double fianchetto. Apart from playing c4, sometimes we keep this square for our knight. I mean, we can try this knight a3, knight c4, or knight d2, knight c4. 
there's no clear idea yet, but if one day, I mean, let us say I play some nonsense, if one day he goes e5, then we have some weak squares, I mean knight c4, then d6 is weak, sometimes bishop a3 becomes powerful. So it is useful to use the c4 square. Of course here we, we castle first, he goes knight bd7, and then I like e4. We already have a powerful center, and unless black plays e5 himself, we'll consider playing e5. Opening that position, and what is more important, we win space. Yeah, I think he has to play e5. He can try maybe b6, but I mean, this is too passive already. I can go e5, I can go c4, maybe a quiet move like rook e1. We are already better as white. So e5 takes. We take. So here we can already see what uh, we were talking about. Perhaps we consider knight c4 and knight d6. And yeah, rook e1 of course, we protect the e4 pawn first. Sometimes, since our bishop is on a closed diagonal, and this is something we see on the king's indian too, the king's indian attack, uh, white can also play bishop f1. Okay, I'm having some issues with the arrows. <laughs> okay, there we go. We can play bishop f1, improving our bishop and putting some pressure on the queen side. Uh, imagine he goes something like b5, then bishop f1, I can play a4, c4. So that position is full of maneuvers. In fact, after rook e1, black decides to play b5. And the reason is, it looks like he's weakening his position on the queen side, but he has to do something about knight c4. Okay, let me clear these arrows. I'm trying to clear the arrows and I, I feel I'm creating new ones. Okay, this is gonna take a while. Okay, I think I'm gonna give up soon. Okay, yeah. What I was trying to uh, say here is, yeah, knight c4 is a threat. Let me just clear them. Let us say he plays h6 here. We are attacking on e5, and if he plays something like rook e8, knight d6 is there, maybe queen d6. We know trading queens off works very well for us. In this line, we trade pieces off, and the end games are supposed to be much better for white. But apart from trading queens, what I, what I want to do is uh, get the bishop there. And then we are guaranteed at least a slight advantage. So I believe uh, that is why a black goes b5 to stop knight c4. So after b5, okay, we don't have knight c4. But we have uh, targets on the queen side. We have to think how to create more weaknesses, how to exploit them. And the first move that comes to mind is 
at least to my mind, is A4. Opening the A file. Attacking on B5 too. And the thing is, I mean, if he passes, if he moves a waiting move, I don't see a real threat, even if I take... Okay, I opened the A file, but there's not much going on there. He can even try playing A5 himself. So... Maybe I can try c4 instead and the difference is here i have a real threat which is taking on b5 and then i play rook c1 opening the c file and i think in this variation i have a much more activity by the way i'm not forced to taking on b5 yet but i can also try rook c1 and, I mean, here we, we see a clear difference. We have some pressure on the C file. We don't know if we are taking on B5 or not, but uh, we have the threat of opening the C file, and that's, that's very good, because having the initiative is what matters. That is the big difference between playing this C4 or maybe A4. With a4, yeah, we improve our position, but we are not getting much. He can just play bishop b7 or a solid move. After c4, we pose uh, some threats. Okay, he tries rook e8. Well, protecting e5 just in case. Once e5 is protected, then he'll be able to move this knight on d7. So, this uh, makes a lot of sense. White plays queen c2. Okay, yeah, I can also try rook c1. I mean, both moves are increasing the pressure on the c file. I'll probably end up playing queen c2 anyway to double up on the C file. So, yeah, I like this move. And by the way, I don't think it's necessary to take on B5 yet, because despite yeah, having this move, we are free in that position. We are also opening this diagonal. So, we have to remember that sometimes the threat taking on b5 is stronger than the execution. Okay, I think I'll give up with the arrows. They are not working today. So, okay, queen c2, a6. What else can he try? I mean, maybe moving the queen. He's never taking on c4. I mean, if he, if he does... Then we, of course, take with the knight. And c6 and a7 are too weak. Two isolated pawns, two targets on the queen side. And what is more, when we have the knight on c4, uh, he can't move that knight on d7. So he's, uh, he's in bad shape in this position because we have a clear uh, positional advantage. So, okay, c4, rook e8, yeah, queen c2, he tries a6. So, well, we can try moving our rook, increasing the pressure on the c file. That's, that makes a lot of sense. That is what logic tells, but when he plays a6, I'm also considering a5 and c5 squares are potential holes. So I don't mind advancing on the queen side. 
I can also consider playing a4 at some point or c5. We are advancing a lot. He's running out of space. Let us say we go something like c5 at some point. And then this bishop, bishop c8 is not doing much. Knight d7 is lacking space. And well, d6 becomes a potential square for a knight, maybe, or a rook. Well, for any piece. So, I like before. Knight b6. Well, if he goes bishop b7, as we said, we can consider playing c5. Or maybe knight b3. But I like c5 because when we play c5, we stop black from freeing his position. I mean, he also wants to play c5 and trade some pieces off. So, this is key. And then knight b3, knight a5, maybe a4. I think we got our goal when we play this opening. And our goal is getting a good position, more space, and we are we are not allowing um, counterplay from our opponent. So okay, he tries knight b6. Well, perhaps he wants to meet c5. I'm not sure about this, because, yeah, knight a4, maybe. Okay, and then, yeah, our bishop is kind of trapped. I mean, it's not trapped, but we are not playing bishop c1, that is too passive. And if bishop a3, then, yeah, he's breaking our pawn structure. We'll be forced to play bishop takes b4, and that's not a good idea. So... There's no rush, c4 is protected, and if knight a4 now we play bishop a1, bishop is safe there, we play an useful move, attacking on the c-file, yeah this couldn't be much better, he goes bishop b7, as usual taking on c4, I don't think it's an option for black. c6 is super weak, so is e5. Okay, he goes with b7. And... Well, I'm considering... I know what uh, white played in this game. I'm also considering playing bishop f1. We know this move is useful. The thing is, if he moves something, then we can consider this plus bishop takes b5. Well, he's, so, he's also opening the a file. Yeah, I'm not sure, because the more we trade, then uh, that's favoring black. I mean, black should be happy if he manages to trade a lot of pieces off because uh, he doesn't have much space. And remember this, when you have more space, you shouldn't trade too many pieces. And, okay, c5, I think it's easier. We win space. And yeah, now black has a tough decision whether to play this or yeah, knight a4. This knight on a4 looks active, and even if he plays a5, the thing is, this knight is out of the game. And there's no way of bringing this knight back, so yeah, from the practice point of view, knight d7 is better. Knight c8 controls the d6 square, but 
since we don't have an easy way to get there, I mean, we cannot play knight c4. I think knight d7 is better. There's also a maneuver, which is knight f8, knight e6, and then knight d4. That is a common maneuver in the king's endian. Problem is, when we have this double fianchetto, we are targeting e5, so it's pretty tough. I'm just doing random moves. It's pretty tough for black to get there, because whenever he plays knight e6, well, the e5 pawn is hanging, so... Here, after knight d7, we keep on improving our position. Maybe we'll play knight a5. Right now, I'm not interested in taking this bishop on b7, because that bishop is too bad. But when I play knight b3, I prevent a5. Maybe I'll consider playing knight a5 one day. I don't think it's necessary at this point, but the threat is there, and that means uh, we have more initiative. And okay, black, yeah, he's lacking space. I'm trying to find a better move for black, but I don't know. I mean, maybe Knight of Fate. I'm trying to play this knight e6, which looks impossible, but maybe if I play this way, overprotecting e5 and then I go knight e6. The thing is, even if I manage to do this, then the d4 square is under control. I mean, I have three pieces there, probably four. And it's black, I'm still on a waiting mood, there's not much I can do. I would try this and maybe move in my knight. I would keep on trading pieces. I would try trading pieces off. But uh, that is the best I can do in this position. h6 looks like an useful move, but in this position it is a waiting move. Rook c1. Well, I think moving this rook to c1, uh, to d1, is better. Rook e1 still controls the center, and I might consider playing rook d6. In fact, uh, we play that. We don't have a clear threat yet, but maybe knight a5 is stronger now. With the rook on d6, knight a5 attacks c6 and bishop b7. And even if he plays a move like this, which in fact is the idea of rook e7, right? When he plays rook e7, he tries to play knight e8. Even if he plays that, we can just leave that rook on d6. He's never taken. Because we win material. And even if we go back to d2, I mean, black's coordination is not ideal. I mean, his rooks are not connected. We black really feels the lack of space in this position. So rook d6. Okay, black continues with waiting moves, knight to a5, okay, I like it. As we said, we don't have a clear threat yet, but we keep on improving our pieces. Maybe uh, in order to finish uh, opening this position, I would play something like h3, just in case, and then a4, maybe bishop f1, But, okay, here black makes uh, 
things easier for us. He is tired of waiting and he tries this sacrifice. I mean, I understand playing this position as black, it's tough, but you can still play King H7. I know it's sad to wait and uh, not having any real counterplay. Maybe as black, uh, this requires a lot of patience, but okay. Uh, I don't feel a move like this works because. That's why we have such a solid position. All our pieces are well coordinated. Uh, there's no way this knight takes c5 works. Um, well, let's see what happens. Well, first of all, if we take with the pawn, then he wins a pawn here. And, well, the pawn doesn't matter much. What matters here is uh, he traded some pieces off, therefore he's free in his position. And the point is, yeah, if queen takes, then he has knight takes. And then, yeah, we have both uh, queen c5 and rook d6 under attack. And he got two pawns. So, looks like the tactic is working, but of course we are not forced to take in on c5 yet, we can play an in-between move, and this is much much better. Now he has to take on f6, otherwise we, we go back to b6, we can even consider if he moves the knight, playing rook takes c6, so bishop takes, and now queen takes. We have two pieces for the rook, and yeah, the extra pawn is not relevant. What what is uh, really relevant is the fact that Bishop a8 is not doing much. So I think we have a winning position already. Since we don't have a pawn on c5 anymore, we can also consider using this square for a knight. So, yeah, queen takes c5, black tries queen a7, well, at this point I don't mind trading pieces off, the more we trade, the better for us. I like this page page 3. The d5 was under control already, but just in case, Guarding the d7 square makes a lot of sense, and if he takes, we have a potential passed pawn on c5, rook d6 becomes stronger, and from the positional point of view, we have a new square. It is not that uh, tough to see knight e1, knight c2, knight b4. I mean, we are crushing here, c6, a6, everything is hanging. And of course, uh, we know the closed position is favoring our pair of knights. Okay, white uh, tries rook d6, king there. Well, I wonder what was white trying to play after bishop b7. Rook is hanging, c5 is hanging. Maybe he can just take on e5. We are sacrificing at two exchanges, but I mean, the compensation. I mean, we have strong compensation. We probably have a better move, maybe even rook d7. I mean, there's no need of sacrificing. Yeah, this should be winning too. I don't want to... I mean, since we have um, a winning position and material is equal, or maybe we have some material advantage, I think there's no need of sacrificing. I mean, here we, we just trade everything off and we should be winning. 
I'm curious here, I'm gonna... I don't recommend doing this often, but... Yeah, bishop takes e5, according to the machine, it says uh, sacrificing this change. I mean, now we are two exchanges down, but yeah, th those rook, those rooks doesn't have, don't have those rooks don't have any squares. I mean, okay, yeah, this is the trick. I mean, yeah, okay, wow, we have uh, such a big uh, positional advantage that we can afford sacrificing, and yeah, rook d7 would be the easy and uh, no risk way to win this but if we calculate a bit uh, we play bishop takes e5 okay um, anyways black played there we keep on improving i think uh, yeah the game is already over he cannot even consider playing bishop e7 now because e5 is always hanging. It would be a check. So, okay, that. He plays bishop d7, but I mean, even after this, bishop f5 should work. Okay, bishop d7. Bishop f5, okay. Black is not able to free his position. No matter no no matter what he does. And then yeah, this is absolutely losing for black. Yeah, I I, I feel this feels it's uh, too early to resign, but I would resign here. Because all I can do is wait and see, as black, I can just wait and see white's improvements in this position. He managed to trade that bishop off, but he cannot stop our knights. I can even play knight before and take on c6 later, but since here. I win on I win the e5 pawn. I can play f4 too. Well, let's see the rest of this game. Uh, we could we could stop the analysis here, but it is nice to check uh, Grandmaster's technique too, because it is uh, important to to see uh, and appreciate the technique. It is never too late to make a huge mistake and lose the entire advantage. That happens often. So, yeah, let's see how white wins here. C6, okay. Yeah, if king f8, we have at least knight e7 check. So, after c6, okay, bishop b7. I like this move. Preparing bishop b6. Or even knight c5. In fact, he plays knight c5. Rook c8. Another nice move by white. We can also take on e6, but here we stop the only counterplay black has, which is playing b4, maybe b3, and this is probably losing too, but. That is the only single chance black has. So why should we take on e6 and allow some random counterplay? There's no need. He just play here, we play king b4. Or, okay, here he plays knight e7. And then king b4, blockading these two guys. And if rook takes e6, then knight e5 check wins the rook. And otherwise, we play king takes b5, and it's over. After king b4, black resigns. Very nice technique. No counterplay at all for black. So, well, in this game, uh, 
we found new ideas. The King's Indian as black, of course. It's a good way to play. Personally, I don't like it that much against the double fianchetto, because white has an easy positional game, and he always, white always has at least a slight advantage in my opinion, and this game is a good uh, proof of that. So I hope you enjoyed watching this game and the analysis. I hope you learned something and we'll continue studying on our next videos. Thank you. Hi, this is Grandmaster Damien Lemos. First of all, I hope you enjoyed um, this video. If you would like to receive more free chess videos from us, you can just click the subscribe button below. I would also highly recommend signing up for my free mail course, The 10 Grandmaster Secrets to Dominate Chess. During this exclusive course from OnlineChessLessons.net, I'll share with you my own Grandmaster shortcuts to effective attacking, defending and growth hacks to improving your chess without uh, complicated books or memorization. So sign up by clicking the sidebar on the right and I know you won't be disappointed. Once more, this is Damien uh, for OnlineChessLessons.net and I'll see you uh, in my videos. Thank you.